Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Coffee Conversations with Forge First Cancer Survivor Center. Today, we will be talking with Dr. Elkanani, um, and we're going to have an AXI expert session this morning, and we are just so excited to be talking with Dr. Elkanani about all things breast cancer here in 2021. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Elkanani. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you so much. So uh, let's start and talk about yourself. Like, let us know uh, a little bit about you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, I'm, um, I was born and raised in Egypt, actually overseas, and I uh, finished my med school earlier in uh, this decade, I guess, in 2011, and uh, moved to the States uh, almost 10 years ago. You know, and ever since I remember, um, you know, it, my mid school years, I've always had an interest in cancer. And, you know, it's always seemed to me as, as a very puzzling and very convoluted this, you know, uh, behavior. And, you know, uh, I was always interested in trying to understand what makes it tick. I remember, you know, coming to the States in 2011, where I did a, a postdoctoral fellowship in Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I worked with the breast cancer group over there and, um, you know, getting firsthand experience to how, how this disease is so complicated and touches the lives of so many people at the same time, you know, trying to get the underpinning of it. And for some, something that is very common has also been very challenging. Um, I um, moved from Mayo to Kansas City, where I did my internal medicine training, and then to Buffalo, New York, where I did my um, uh, oncology training. And um, at that time, at that juncture, I knew that I definitely wanted to uh, become um, involved in breast cancer care and all its aspects from, from lab to what we call translational research to actual patient care. And you know, in the process, I'm taking care of my patients, also trying to understand what makes that cancer tick, what's what's its Achilles, you know, um, and and how can we how can we you know outsmart it? And part of that was to kind of be involved in few uh, uh, clinical trials and involved in um, uh, involved in um, understanding breast cancer in a, in a genomic level. And UEB has been actually in the forefront of, of doing uh, these approaches to, uh, to cancer care in general and breast cancer specifically. And so I decided that I'm gonna move, you know, you know for, uh, from all the way up there to all the way down here. And I did that move within two years ago. Uh, and since then I've been, I've been in the breast cancer center here at UEB, taking care of patients and um, trying to understand uh, breast cancer better. Well, thank you so much for coming on down to Alabama. Uh, we hope that you like our hospitality, as they like to say, Southern hospitality. <laughs> oh, I love um, it. It's real. <laughs> yes, we hold the door and we say hey to everybody. <laughs> so um, since you've started this journey and your professionalism and your studies of breast cancer, of course, like this new world of this, this pandemic, you know, it's created a, a new norm. It's created so many different um, differences in a journey when someone's diagnosis with breast cancer. So since um, the pandemic has began, have you all seen, or have you in particular seen any rises in the breast cancer diagnosis trend? Um, and do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic has had an effect on this? So the, the short answer is, you know, un unfortunately, you know, a lot of patients ended up missing their annual mammograms when the pandemic hit. And um, yeah, a lot of centers felt like it was uh, something that can be deferred. Um, there were a few researches that came back in the past couple of uh, months that did demonstrate that there is an ever so slight increase in mortality and in death rate from breast cancer, unfortunately. And part of, had, and part of that has to do with uh, delayed presentation, right? A lot of a lot of ladies would not know that there is uh, something happening until they get their mammograms, and that was delayed. We have seen an uptick in later cases, and and that translates into a little bit of a higher mortality rate. Um, now, thankfully, now we have a lot of you know a lot of um, um, you know ways to kind of minimize risk transmission, and mammograms have continued now uh, to work. But, that, but I think COVID has impacted that 
uh, that part of breast cancer and then incidence. The other thing that it did, which changed a little bit of how we manage the uh, um, early stage breast cancer in the term of, you know, we've become more and more, um, uh, you know, uh, seasoned in using uh, agents that can, uh, like, a, like pills or potentially even chemotherapy that would delay the, instead of uh, just waiting for the surgery to happen. And a lot of ladies with small cancers end up getting surgery up front and then hormone pills sometime later on. And then we, we managed to switch that and we found out that doing that really does not impact the big picture. So it changed both the incidence as well as the treatment paradigm. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're, we're um, right now we're just playing catch up with those who got delayed diagnosis. Wow. That's, that's really helpful information. And um, it's not something people necessarily think about um, when it comes to just the different effects of COVID-19 on the medical world and specifically to breast cancer. Um, so those are really great things to know. And I'm so glad that things are in a better space now. So people are able to start getting those mammograms again. And, you know, they're just being a little bit more involved in their care as well. So there's not such a, a huge gap in, because everything is shut down anymore. You know, everything is like opening up now. So um, when an individual is seeking methods of prevention, um, what can they do to help prevent breast cancer? Um, just anyone, you know, not necessarily those who do have a family history, but if this is a concern for somebody um, who just learns of breast cancer, the impact that it has on the community, what are some uh, methods of prevention that those individuals can take? All right. So, um, you know, breast cancer, most most of the forms of it are hormone driven. And we have, um, you know, we have our laundry list of um, potential, um, you know, culprits that can actually increase the risk of, of breast cancer happening. And some of them are, you know, um, are quite common, for example, hormone pills, right? So, so people who are taking contraceptive pills or hormone replacement therapy after menopause or after removing their ovaries, these can increase the risk of breast cancer slightly. So one, one preventive measure is if somebody using these uh, pills for no, for, you know, for, you know, and then we can do something different, it would be uh, a high on the list to try to switch to something that is less uh, associated with breast cancer. For example, a non-medicated IUD, or um, you know, instead of using hormone replacement therapy, using a non-hormonal methods to prevent you know some of the postmenopausal symptoms. Um, some other factors that do increase the risk of breast cancer include alcohol, smoking, body fat composition, and that has to do directly with the fact that, you know, uh, fat tissues can produce small amounts of estrogen. So cutting on alcohol, cutting on smoking, uh, maintaining a, a, a body mass index below 25, ideally, or below 30, um, all of these have been shown to decrease the risk of breast cancer. Uh, physical exercise, physical activity, reprograms the body's metabolism, in such a way that it um, it also kind of shifts the uh, shift the metabolic ways away from fat you know uh, fat tissue generation and increased estrogen levels. So these are some of the uh, you know more of like the the uh, general health sort of like factors that people can can think of whenever we talk about breast cancer. Thank you. Um, so for those who are um, you know experiencing a family history. Um, aside from those general health um, preventative methods that they can take and, or be more mindful of for those who, you know, have that history of breast cancer in their family, um, are, they, are, are they at a higher risk? And if so, what are some things that they can do to make sure they stay on top of um, either being preventative or just catching it early? Right. So, so generally speaking, one of the most important preventive measures, whether or not there is a family history, would be the mammograms, right? So the mammograms have been shown that they improve uh, um, survival in, in, in patients who undergo routine mammograms because we detect cancers earlier and we can act upon earlier. Um, for those who have family history or those who have just higher, more, more or less higher factors, generally speaking, you know, uh, of breast cancer, um, you know, we always encourage them to kind of go in and talk with their provider. There are tools out there that we can estimate uh, um, a woman's lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. And if that number is high, 
then there are some methods that we can actually take that are a little bit more uh, involved uh, to decrease this risk of breast cancer uh, development. Um, you know, so for example, there's a calculator called IBIS, where in IBIS you would put the uh, uh, family history of a patient, you would put the, all the intrinsic factors that I mentioned, including the age, the, um, you, know, you know, some of the weight, some of these factors, and it'll tell you um, there is a so-and-so risk of developing breast cancer. Now, based on this risk, there are, you know, there are some other modalities that we can involve. There is a whole um, clinic in UAB called High Risk Breast Cancer Clinic. And this is for ladies with a high risk of developing breast cancer. There are pills that we can decrease breast cancer risk with. There are obviously surgeries, which usually is reserved for very high risk uh, of development. The genetic testing also has its own criteria when it, that's uh, requested. And genetic testing uh, doesn't, we used to test a gene called BRCA1 and 2 up until 2013. And, and now we know that there's a laundry list of these genes, you know, P10, TB53, BOB2, it's a soup of words. But, but that tells you that it's just not one or two genes. So there's also a couple of them. And each gene comes with its own little caveats about what needs to happen if, if some an individual have this gene. Um, uh, a smarter way to go about screening mammograms, which I think is very important, especially for those with a family history, would be to participate in one of these screening mammogram trials. And there is a trial at U of it's called Wisdom Trial. So Wisdom Trial is, is actually a national trial open for all ladies after the age of 40, um, and which is what we recommend screen mammograms to start anyways. And in that trial, they try to correlate a routine screening mammogram with each individual uh, uh, genetic um, sort of like susceptibility risk. They use what's called polygenic risk score, uh, which is essentially uh, another more uh, detailed way of looking at the gene makeup of a person uh, and the risk of developing breast cancer. So it's a great trial. I think if anybody's interested in screening, definitely should consider the wisdom trial uh, as well. It's going to add an extra layer of prevention. Yes, I have actually um, heard of the wisdom study, and um, I think that that is an awesome resource um, from individuals who know that they have a family history and just kind of want to, you know, take that first step into finding out what they need to do moving forward. Um, and in saying all of that, so say there's an individual who takes these preventative steps or does not, you know, whatever their situation may be, they're here at a point now, I have just been diagnosed. What are the first steps that that person would need to take? Right. So, um, so this is usually the, the I think it's the toughest time of anyone's, you know, any, any, any patient's life when they ever hear, you know, they get, you usually get the call back, right? You usually get a call back. Hey, your mammogram showed something. We need to do a little bit more imaging. You do the more imaging and then they tell you, well, we end up, we're going to have to do a biopsy and they do the biopsy and then you get the call back. Um, it's a tough phone call you know, and it never goes down easy. And, um, but I think what I always urge patients is to get more information first. The most important thing prior to, prior to make any decisions, prior to kind of make any, you know, uh, any uh, um, sort of like uh, commitment to one particular tumor or another, understand what that means, understand what that diagnosis is, understand how that is impactful to your health. You know, breast cancer spectrum is so wide. As a matter of fact, um, it is not one disease, it's a plethora of diseases lumped together. There is a very mild, easily curative, absolutely no impact in your life kind of thing. And there is a type that we need to start treating within a couple of days worth of time. So where do you fall in that category? So I think, I think the most important thing is to get accurate, comprehensive, and um, I would say full circle sort of like information about the cancer. And you know, um, usually the consensus is for cancer care for that first appointment, it should be a panel appointment. It should be a discussion, not just with the surgeon, but also with the medical oncologist and even a radiation doctor it should be a panel of, of folks who come in and it, each one sort of like puts light on, um, on, the, on what we have. Armed with that information, then patients can make their informed decision about what would be the next steps. 
Yeah, thank you so, so much. And um, I think that's awesome that you're saying you, you need to have the full picture before you like make any decision and, and really take right. that in. And, and it's true because the thing is, um, you know, uh, some ladies would just say, you know, that's cancer. We need to get, I need to get it out of my body. You know, I need to, to remove it today. And that most of the time is actually not the right answer. You know, there's a lot of reasons for that, but um, the most important thing is to understand what is, you know, what the type of that cancer is. And for, for, select, uh, for, like, for select types of cancers, it might be that it needs some sort of a systemic therapy first. Something goes into your body first. And again, um, doing, doing mastectomies, you know, might also not be necessarily what you need. So a, a lot of these decisions have to be made after a conjunction call. So for example, in UAB, we have the interdisciplinary breast cancer clinic. And what it, that is, in the same day, there's a medical oncologist, a radiation doctor, and, um, and, a, um, and a surgeon. That we all see patients together where we talk about, this is the best plan of care from each one of us. And then we develop the plan in real time. And then we go and discuss with patients and, and take it from there. Oh, thank you so much. So my next question might be a little loaded, <laughs> but um, inquiring minds would, would love to know a little bit more about what are the the classical ways of treating breast cancer. And um, if you could give us a little information specifically on hormone therapy and those side effects and what that process is like. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you know, we can we can talk about that for days, right? But um, what the short of it is, you know, to truly treat breast cancer, you need multidisciplinary care, right? You, it's not a one-man job. And um, you would most likely need at the very least three doctors. You would need your surgeon, you will need your radiation doctor, and you will need the medical oncologist. Um, you know, I always kind of go through this with my patient in the surgery and the radiation um, deal with what we call local uh, uh, control. Uh, the uh, medical oncologist deals with systemic control. So the surgery is trying to get the cancer out, whether that's a lumpectomy, which is removing the piece of cancer itself uh, with a little safety uh, edge around it, or a mastectomy, which is removing the whole breast. Um, each of those has their indications. It's not like one of them is better than the other. These are different approaches uh, to the same problem. Uh, radiation comes in as a complementary to some of these approaches. You know, radiation can be uh, needed um, after mastectomy, usually we can skip it if patients do mastectomy, can, but it has their own indication. But most of the time radiation is employed after a lumpectomy to sort of like sterilize the breast area after the cancer was removed. But them alone do, again, local control, which is taking care of where the cancer is at and preventing it from coming back in that breast area. Um, systemic therapy, which believe it or not, a lot of patients do not know why we even do it, right? And they, they come and tell me, doc, well, I got the cancer out. The, the surgeon said the margins were negative and clear. What am I even doing anything after that? And it really has to do with the fact that even small, tiny breast cancers would send, you know, uh, raw cancer cells to the body. We call them circulating tumor cells. And these can actually escape the breast well before the surgery and can lead to cancer coming back elsewhere in the body years down the line. And that's what we call stage four. In fact, that's how we knew back in the day that doing more surgeries was not the right answer. You know, we used to just cut more and cut more and the cancer would still come back. And we didn't know why. And the answer is that it was really never about the surgery. It's about the cells that escaped the breast in the first place. So that systemic therapy that gets tailored to the type of breast cancers that, that patients have. And you know, it depends on what's driving the cancer cells. If they are hormone dependent, you get the hormone blockers therapy, which we just mentioned. If they have the HER2 protein, you get an anti-HER2 therapy. Or if they have neither, you get, you know, you, we don't know what's driving it. We throw the bomb at it, which is essentially chemotherapy. Um, but you know, the most common, so you know, about four out of five ladies would end up having a hormone receptor positive breast cancer. It's quite the most common one. And the, the classical treatment here, the classical systemic therapy to kill any rogue cells would be hormone blockers. And these are small, tiny little pills, but they're fairly mighty as well. They, you know, um, the best way to explain how they do is that, um, you know, if the cancer is dependent on the estrogen hormone, 
um, which is, by the way, still present even after menopause. In fact, uh, most breast cancers that we see are for ladies after menopause, and they depend on hormones. She tells you that the estrogen must be there, and these cancers grow on it. So the hormone blocker pills just lower estrogen level even more, uh, pushing people more into, uh, would you say, a, a deeper state of menopause, a lower level of estrogen. Um, so they can experience some of the menopausal side effects that they've already experienced before, similar to hot flashes, night sweats, joint aches, uh, weight gain, um, and, and the sorts. Um, the, the, the silver lining is just like menopause, you know, they might not cause any trouble at all. You know, some ladies have, you know, absolutely didn't even know that they went into menopause, right? And same goes for these pills. And the right answer, whenever I see a patient and talk with them about it is, you know, if they have trouble, you let us know. You know, there's many ways that we can avoid some of these side effects or at least minimize it and mitigate it. Um, but the last thing we want is we will stopping their hormone blocker pills without talking to their physicians because, you know, um, they work. And um, in fact, the, the research said that if you do your hormone blocker pill for five years, which is the usual recommended time for, for our therapies, um, daily pill for five years, whatever risk of breast cancer you have at the time of surgery of it coming back gets uh, slashed down by 50%, by half. So if your risk was two, 3%, it goes down to one, but it was, if it was 10, it goes down to five and so on and so forth. Wow. I think that's awesome too. Um, and it's great information to know that, you know, each breast cancer is treated so differently. And, you know, that kind of just goes back to, to why it's so important to get that full picture. And, and as we're continuing to move forward in learning new different things and learning new treatments and learning more yeah. about different genes and, and different breast cancers, um, what are the biggest differences that you can say that you've seen um, in your studies and, and from others, um, the difference in treatment now versus 20 to 30 years ago? So that's a great question. And I think that I hear that question a lot when, you know, when uh, patients come in and say, um, you know, my mom had breast cancer, my aunt had breast cancer, and they did horrible with the treatment, so and so, and radiation, so and so. And then I ask, when was that? And it's like, that was 20, 30 years ago. No, it's, it's, it is completely different. So each step in the process have evolved significantly. So the surgeries are significantly less invasive. The evaluation of the lymph nodes are significantly less uh, cumbersome and have a lot less side effects you know, um, in this day and age. Radiation used to be pretty raw, pretty rough, that's true. Uh, but now uh, with the understanding of the biology and with even just better machines, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of become more of like a, it's an ordeal that the toughest part about radiation now is just it's the fact that it's daily. But about that, the, you know, people would say, oh, I got a little, you know, um, a little uh, uh, skin burn here or there. Now, you know, there are some situations where it can be a little bit more involved in this, and that's true, especially in cancers that have more, uh, more, uh, I would say, more um, radiation involved to it. But for breast cancer, uh, typically speaking, radiation is not affecting um, as much uh, of the skin. Now, talk about some of the other therapies, which is chemotherapy, for example, or um, some of these hormone blocker agents. A lot of these are now, um, uh, they are not necessarily different drugs, but our understanding of how they work and what the side effects that they can cause and our supportive care has changed drastically. So and it's true that if I give chemotherapy with any complementary medicines that people will do bad. That is true. However, we never do that, right? And the complementary medicines and even the approaches and the doses uh, have changed drastically. Um, we also have a lot of new agents um, on the rise and those have virtually um, pretty much no side effects compared to the classical chemotherapies. For example, there's a very common chemotherapy called baclitaxel um, or taxel it's used uh, unanimously for breast cancer care, whether it's stage uh, one, two, three, and four, 
um, it's very common. So the taxol has been around for years and years, and now there is a pill form of the bactaxel. It's a pill form of that chemotherapy, and the taxol, if you're asking about it, breast cancer, it'll tell you, oh, it just caused my hair to just go away in a in a in a in a heartbeat. You know, first time you get it, hair hair is gone. Well, the pill doesn't do that. You know, and you get the same benefit. You don't get any of the side effects. So it's interesting that you now that the cancer care has evolved so much and the support of care has evolved so much that the chances of getting bad problems with treatments are virtually non-existent. Thank you so much, Dr. Elkanani. I mean, and I know that's comforting news to some who, you know, might have just gotten this diagnosis and they're listening to a family member who may have had it and they're like, this is my experience, so get ready. And to and it's so it'll be comforting to know, you know, this experience could be very different. Um, and there are different opportunities for certain treatments. Now, you know, there is the silver line, is it? Or at least I would say the, the uh, an honest, complete picture is there will always be uh, some situations where things get a little out of control. There will always be a problem with a low, low, low blood count here caused an infection because people to be in a hospital or bad, you know, neuropathy in the hands that cause people to have very tough time. And, and, and that can happen. And that is, you know, we still run into problems like these. But on average, you know, um, we're not running into them as frequently as before. And on average, most of my patients, the first time before they go into chemo, I typically you know, like to kind of talk with them very, uh, very uh, uh, openly about, you know, you will tell me, you will tell me that whatever you're going to go through, it was a little better than what you expected. And I always get the answer that that is truly the case. So. Well, that's awesome. Um, and, and I'm sure that makes them feel great too, to be able to say, okay, like, you know, I can do this and um, having that support, I'm sure, you know, makes a huge difference as well. Um, and so, you know, when an individual is going through know what is the difference in active treatment and um, what that process is and then also why is it so important for them to continue treatment and and well not necessarily treatment but follow-up care um, what's the difference between that treatment active treatment and follow-up care I guess is is what I'm wondering um, yeah well so so essentially you know once patients are done with their uh, local therapy in the a big part of it, as I mentioned, would be systemic therapy, right? The systemic therapy is think of it as a consolidation therapy to try to uh, minimize the risk of cancer coming back. Now, this part, this part, duration of it can differ by different cancer types and by different cancer stages. So, um, you know, it can go up to 10 years. So a higher stage hormone receptor positive with cancer, these pills might go on for five, even 10 years. Uh, HER2 positive breast cancer, the care can, can go well into two, three years. Um, and same goes for some of the other types. So the, the um, after finishing this part, you know, and I think that has directly to do with, with what FORGE does is comes in the survivorship part. So finishing your cancer. So, so during the surgery, you probably can say that you're cancer, you're cancer free after your surgery, because there will be no evidence of cancer that we can see. Uh, but the word cancer free is also loaded. Again, what we typically mean when we say that is that there is no cancer that I'm seeing with my own eyes, but doesn't mean that there are cancer cells in there that might cause cancer to come back. So there's always this risk. And we cannot say that the risk of it coming back is zero because we are not able to see you know, whether or not you have any of these cells in your body. So, so I tell patients, you know, you're cancer free, but you get a follow up because we don't know if any of these cancer cells are there or not. So you finish your systemic therapy, you finish your pills, or you finish your Herceptin, or you finish whatever, and then comes in the surveillance stage. So that involves essentially doing your mammograms, if you have breast tissue left, uh, doing some blood work, doing, you know, bone densities that can affect the chemo, doing heart echoes if you had any medicine that can affect the heart, you know, and seeing a provider. And that provider ideally should be an oncologist or, um, or a survivorship clinic. Now, survivorship is a new concept. It's, um, 
um, a lot of patients will say, I, I would feel more comfortable seeing my cancer doc. In fact, you probably should be feel more comfortable seeing a survivor's clinic specialist because what they do, they're that step in the middle between a cancer doc and a primary care doctor. So they focus on the long-term side effects of the medicines and the treatments that we've used for treatment of breast cancer, but they're also very ori and very uh, aware of, uh, of uh, long um, long-term risk of cancer relapse um, and if it coming back. I think mm -hmm. it, I'm sorry, got disconnected for a second there. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Um, and I think that that is so important to, to remember that survivorship piece of it, because when the physical part is done, what about the mental? What about the emotional? Because some people go through their diagnosis to get through it, and then they deal with whatever it is that they need to deal with after. So I think that that's an ex extremely important part. As you mentioned, that's something that we really, really value here at Forge. You know, um, as long as there's breast cancer, there's Forge. So there's always going to be a piece in your life that you're going to need that support and that community um, as you start to deal with the long term side effects of your breast cancer diagnosis and the things that you went through while you were getting that treatment. Right. And, and, and again, it's part of the fact that, you know, as we are you know, as we are progressing through the through time and as we're learning more and more about breast cancer, there are more and more modalities that we can actually, you know, zone in and, and, and stratify those who might be a little bit of higher risk of recurrence, even after everything is said and done. So being plugged in into the community, being able to, you know, have these open conversations with your oncologist or your survivorship, you know, guide uh, uh, provider, um, all of these are important. You know, we... Um, you know, I, I don't say that to scare people off, but the, the data do show that unfortunately these hormone receptor positive risk cancers, they can come back and they can come back pretty late. We, you know, we have data that they, they can come back 10, 15 and 20 years after the original diagnosis, same cancer. The cells can still be alive. Obviously, not everybody will have that happen. And the odds are people will not have cancer coming back. But because of this, we tend not to let our guards down. And I think that's a great practice because you just never know. And um, and I love that point that you made about pl staying plugged into the community because, you know, there's always going to be new information. There's always going to be new studies. So it's so great to just kind of just stay in the know so that if there is something that you can be preventative about um, and be aware of, it can be more helpful in the future. And so in this journey and, and um you know, once a person reaches that stage of survivorship, so they're doing their annual appointments and they're doing their, they're in the know. Is there ever a point that a patient can say, I am cured? Uh, I think we touched upon it, but I think, I think this point, uh, you know, I think you can say that right after you're done with your surgery, but I think they also need to understand the limitations of it, right? Um, when, when I, when I tell my patients you're cured, I always say with a footnote, right? The footnote is, you know, I don't see any cancer in your body, but the reality is there might be cells out there that we don't know it. You know, I, I'm, 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 I'm giving treatments. We're doing chemotherapies or hormone pills or Herceptin or all of these, you know, um, all of the things. Uh, to try to kill these cells, and we will we'll do a pretty good job at it, but it's never going to be zero. But for all practical purposes, for you to sleep well at night, we don't see any evidence of cancer. Now, there's always this follow-up question, which I think is important, and, and patients would ask, how would I know if it came back? If there is, if you tell me that there might be a chance of it coming back, well, what do I know? I, I need to go on with my life. I need to know what I need to do, you know, so that, that doesn't happen. And it, it, it's true. It's true. I think it's, it's, it's a tough answer to this because we don't have any tool that would tell you, I, I can't give you a test or a medicine tell you, this is it. That's your magic answer. You take this and you're done. You know, if we do that, we would have eradicated cancer, right? If you think about it, if we're able to cure it in the sense of we are sure it's not going to come back, we, then, then what are we doing? Then we'll be done. Unfortunately, we're not yet. And, you know, there is also a lot of research that's being done on 
what are the screening tools to kind of make sure that you know we detect it if before you know before it's it's bad and uh, some of these are well documented for example MRIs and mammograms every year for those who have a history of breast cancer but um, but some of those are a little bit more experimental and still not a standard um, for example what's called circulating tumor DNA and circular tumor cells, which is blood work that looks for cancer cells in the blood. Now it's very tricky to look for cells in blood because they tend to break apart pretty easily. Uh, however, we have some of the, these tools and what the, the questions now are, what do we do if these cells are there? Does that mean the patients will develop cancer or not? We don't know. Um, how would that factor in with the word, am I cured? Like if you're cured, but you have some circulating cells in your body, that, what is that factor in, right? So a lot of these questions are still up in the air. But for now, if you had your successful surgery, um, I think you're cured. And I think, you know, the next step is just to make sure we minimize the risk of it coming back. Thank you, Dr. Elkanani. Um, and I love those points um, and that comfort, even in that statement, like if, you know, we're just going to keep an eye on it, basically, like, yes, you're cured. Right now, we don't detect any cancer cells in you, but we do want to keep an eye out. Um, so just continuing the importance of continuing that care. Um, are there any other final thoughts? You've, you've given us so much valuable information, um, and I'm so excited about that. Um, is there anything else that you would like to leave our viewers and listeners with? Um, uh, I mean, not, not as much. I think one thing that I would like to highlight, and that's because I'm very passionate about it, is whenever I see my patient at the clinic, the, you know, I like to sit down and have a rather long conversation, especially these first times with them. And, um, I am a very strong advocate about educating patients, about patients knowing what's going on and being able to actually make informed decisions. You know, my pit beef is when I talk with patients and I ask them, do you know what's, what type of cancer do you get? What is your understanding of it? What is the stage that you were told? You know, and then, um, and then they, don't, they don't know. And, and they, it's not like they don't want to know. They do want to know and understand. So I think what I would leave patients with, well, if anyone who's hearing this with is, if you or somebody you know got that recent diagnosis, do not make decisions unless you understand what you have. Do not let anybody bully you. And I hate to say that word, but it, it can happen. Do not let anybody, anybody bully you. You get all these phone calls, right? Family, friends, cousins that you have no idea that they even existed. All of a sudden, everybody start calling you. And like, oh, you know, we got this, you know, uh, uh, family doctor is using that, you know, mix of one, two, three, four, five stuff, or we got this uh, 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 provider or whatever, or we get this, or we get that, or you got to, you, you have to do a bilateral mastectomy. That's the only way out. Don't make any decisions before you completely understand what you have. And before you completely understand, and here's the bigger part, the pros and cons of the different options. It might seem overwhelming when I say that, but it truly is empowering. You know, if you don't understand the pros and cons of doing a lumbectomy versus a mastectomy, for example, if you don't true, if you cannot say, if you don't truly know it, then how can you make, how can you, how can I ask you to make a decision off of it? You know what I mean? So get information, get accurate information, ask around. Cancer diagnosis is tough, but it's not immediate left there. And it's not like a heart attack. You have time. You have time to look, to research, to figure out you know, um, to figure out where you can get your information from, get information, collect, get second opinions, ask around, and then, and then make an informed decision. Thank you so much, Dr. Elkanani. And those are wonderful highlights um, I wanted to add. Um, that is so important to know that you do have time. Um, as we've mentioned, I know multiple times in our conversation, you don't have to make a decision as soon as you hear the diagnosis, like get the full picture of what's going on. Um, I'm, I'm just so appreciative. Uh, we are appreciative here at Forge for you taking the time out to just give us such wonderful insights about all things breast cancer. Um, and we hope to talk with you again soon. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. I am about to.